All right, uh, so I'm happy to be here. Thank you for everyone to, that came over here. Um, so I'm going to talk tonight about the package that I'm working on for time series analysis. Uh, it's a weird name. Uh, TS2 just came out of, I thought about calling it a TS2, but somebody already took it. So I ended up with this because another package is supporting ML Studio. Um, so I'm going to give like a big bit over uh, overview about time series and time series in R. Um, the package, the key function is like a short demo about doing forecasting with this package. So just a bit about me, I'm a data scientist at uh, EY based in Detroit. Um, I love R, I love more time series. Uh, and I'm author of two packages. One is the ML Studio, which is available only in GitHub. It's a platform for machine learning based on Shiny. And the other one is what I'm going to talk uh, tonight. Uh, if anyone wants to contact, I have my, this is my GitHub page and my Twitter. I'm not sure what uh, you do with Twitter, but I have one. Um, so just a, a quick poll. Uh, how many work or familiar with time series? Okay, yeah. I think that's a few. Uh, the forecast package. Okay, of course. Uh, Zoo and XTS and the uh, Plotly. Okay. So, um, so just a bit of background about time series, and I'm sorry that the slide have been a bit cut a little bit, but. Uh, so time series is the process of uh, analyzing a time series data in order to extract uh, some meaningful insights about the data to learn about past events or to forecast future events. Uh, basically, I think it's like one of the most popular structure of data available today because today uh, anything is that is digital is capturing data <coughs> over some kind of interval of time so it's become time series and this is the definition of time series data it needs to be uh, <coughs> something that describes some event or phenomena that uh, occur over time which based on a, a equally spaced time interval so if you have like few observations that are not equally spaced in terms of time so it's not really a time series or at least not by the definition um, and the idea is to take uh, the data and find the relationship based on the time. So just a, a quick overview of what is the TS Studio. Uh, so it uh, provides a set of tools mainly now for descriptive analysis of time series, but some utility <coughs> tools for forecasting. Uh, it's a combination of taking bits from other package and combine it into one place. Uh, so it support TS, MTS, uh, which is the, the R base uh, formats for uh, time series or multiple time series, the Zoo and the XTS, which are more in use uh, in finance for uh, uh, time series data. And also it support a, a forecasting object out of the forecast package. So if you have a model, you can uh, take the model and plot it. Um, I started as it was like a side project to support the other package that I'm working on. The ML Studio, if we have time, maybe we, I will show what, what it, it's doing. So it's a platform based on Shiny that uh, one of its users is for application and is in time series. And it, the code start to become too messy. So I realized that I need to outsource some of the code outside and and shift it into another packages and I started to work on it. Uh, basically, I, I created the package over nine hours while flying. Uh, I'm more productive when I'm flying than <laughs> on ground. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and then I realized that there could be more application. I accumulate what I'm working on a daily basis on with time series data. So I start to accumulate function as I, I decided maybe I also should put them over there and then it's become the, this package. 
Um, because of the ML Studio, it's designed to work with China, and that's why I, I choose the Plotly. So the Plotly package is uh, uh, one of the, I think, best data visualization packages in R today. Uh, it's interactive based on JavaScript, um, and technically it's really, besides beautiful, really has great uh, applications that you can do for analyzing data. So I find it really useful. Um, and the idea is to take, to take uh, with minimum code to get maximum results. Because uh, until now I had a function that I wrote function and it, it becomes so big and I want to minimize it to save some time. Uh, last it's, and what is it's entered last week to the uh, top, so after this in her blog, uh, they every month they released uh, the list of the top 40 releases. So it's entered to the list of uh, January, so this is kind of the structure of the package. Uh, so uh, the inputs are time series object, zoo, or uh, XPS object, uh, and also the forecast. So those are, those are objects that uh, represent time series data, and this is out of the those represent forecasting models enter into the package and then you the outputs are utility functions uh, forecast uh, performance uh, measurements and the visualization application which is kind of the main one at this moment so the idea is so this is the base uh, function in the I think it's the stats package in our the base the inner rate package uh, so this is taking the air passenger data, it's time series uh, of number of passengers, it's like the iris of the time series data. Uh, and uh, this is how it looks in normal, uh, uh, normal function, and this is how it looks with uh, this package. So the idea is uh, it's interactive. Uh, so I'm, I'm not familiar how, how you work with the mouse, but if I want to capture, like, yeah, right oh, okay, got it. Yeah. So you can subset uh, part of the data. You can um, you can play with it. It's really cool because when this is not really okay. I'm I'm new to Mac, so take me more time. So it's all interactive and, and you can shift it. And the idea is that when you have a lot of lot of uh, data, it's really useful because you can take out some of the plots and play with it. And I will show you in a second what I'm talking about. And this is like with additional, uh, so this is one of the base uh, functions. And the idea is to throw your data. If it's a uh, multiple time series, it will plot all of it. If it's single, it will identify it and plot a single time series. You have like sliders, so you can select a window, window of time, and then those are all like fun stuff. It's not really exciting. So again, um, this is now going to examples. Um, this is taking uh, multiple t uh, time series uh, using the uh, the quant, uh, quant mode uh, package we spoke about it before. Uh, you can download the uh, so I'm downloading your stocks of uh, closing prices of Apple, Facebook, Google, and Microsoft, uh, and then I want to present them. So uh, this is how the data is look. It's in, in XPS <coughs> format. Uh, so, for example, I got the Google and I have a lot of uh, information uh, about the open price, the high price, the low price, and so on. And now I want to take the close prices and plot them. So I'm just doing like playing with the data a little bit. Uh, set, I'm doing CBind and then uh, create a new object called the closing. Mm. So now I have four. Uh, Columns with the prices of the stocks, the the price of the closing, and again, this is 
uh, how it looks when you just put it in uh, this the same function. You can add title uh, and you get it uh, in a multiple plot fashion. You can also, if you want to see it in, in a one plot, you can just use different mode, uh, the single, and then you can see all of them. So uh, sometimes it's much more nicer to compare it in that mode. And for example, you see now that you have like four stocks. One is really, this is I think Google, it's really way off, uh, it's, it's different scale. And if you want to see like better what's going on over here, so you can just remove goods, remove it. Uh, so this is functionality of Plot, it's not functionality of this package, but uh, this is one of the reasons that I'm using this because I find it really useful. And one of the main things that there is in this package is a bunch of seasonality plots for seasonality analysis. Uh, so usually when you work with time series data, there is a lot of uh, seasonality and you want to capture it. Uh, and this example, this is the uh, natural gas consumption in the U US since 2000. And just looking at it, you can see there is a seasonality, uh, but there is more into it. Uh, you want to see also if there is trend and other characteristics. So this is one of the functions for uh, capturing seasonality. So you just put the object and you get it sliced by uh, in this by the cycle period. So in this case, this is uh, monthly. So you get by the cycle period, and this is the years. So it's been cut, but this is uh, each line represents the year. So for example, if you want to see what is the trend if your data is is the uh, shifting over time or is it trending up, turning up, down. Uh, so you can go and see that overall the yield goes up, meaning that <coughs> data is trending up. Uh, you consume more as time passing by. If you have any question, yeah, feel free to ask. And this is another approach. If you want to see overall if uh, for example, if in this case, <coughs> this is January, always January is in the top. So cut it by the, uh, by the I'm presenting it by the month. Each, each month receive a line and then you can check if you have like uh, variation in the, between the months. And overall those, which is makes sense in this case, those are the winter months uh, that are on the top and they stay in the same order, more or less. And this is the last one. Uh, and this is different representation. So you have the distribution of each month. Um, so you can see like, for example, in this case that April is a bit, April and uh, July and August are, the consumption is really in a narrow interval and January as a wide interval it could be that we have outliers in the data or from other reason. Um, and this is if you want to see all of them together and I think this is like you get all the picture, the full picture because here you can see that uh, looking only on this you know the distribution but you, you don't know if the distribution is because of uh, the trend over time increasing or because it's random and looking at this you can identify that it's also because of the trend so you start those are early years and as you go up it's probably the recent period and this is another um, method to visualize uh, seasonality is heat map uh, i know it's a bit maybe if you're not familiar with heat map it's kind of overwhelming but Basically, each, each square is a month, uh, starting the year over here, and the, each, uh, and the y-axis is the, the months, the cycle, the cycle period, and this is the year. Uh, and the scale as it goes toward the yellow, it's 
means that we consume more. So overall, you see, this is the highest point, 2014 January. And if someone been here in 2014, it was a rough winter, uh, one of the coldest in in the recent years. Uh, and then you see like a consumption of here. And also you can see a trend. So if you go to, for example, uh, June, when the consumption shouldn't be high during this time, you see that it starts really dark and then it starts to shift toward the light yellow, which means that over time we're consuming. So we have also trend, upper trend, based on this plot and uh, also seasonality. So the seasonality is that the colors are keeping the same uh, the same uh, scale, but they going towards as we moving to the right, we're going towards the uh, upper side of the scale. There are other. I didn't put all the function. There are other function. I didn't want to, you know, start getting boring or talking about seasonality. But there is a polar plot, and there is a. A surface like three 3D plot that you can see similar idea. Uh, another tools that the package uh, provide is correlation. Uh, so one of the things that we want to find in time series is correlation and help us to identify the relationship between uh, periods. And then in this example, uh, you familiar? Anyone familiar with the ACF auto correlation function? Okay, so um, this plot just showing the the correlation of each of the series with the with the, with its legs. So, for example, in this case, uh, this is the first the first leg. So, the, the this is the correlation of the current leg with itself. So, it's one. It's like the diagonal when you look at the normal correlation table, and then this is the correlation of the current one with the leg one. Uh, and then so on. So basically one saying here, this is a full cycle. And, and in this case, the full cycle is 12 months. So we see that overall, we are really correlated with the previous year. So this January correlated with the previous January. And it's decay, but still there is correlation also two years ago and three years ago. This is kind of really high stat uh, plus that you use when you're doing time series, but I think this is a better representative and you can understand faster uh, by using the legs. The legs plot is just doing the same, but it just plot the current series with its legs. So it's, it starts to like, this is the leg one. Uh, and you see like, the, you can understand like the, the relationship and as it's moving on until leg 12. You see like here, it's almost really, we have good uh, correlation over here, it's almost one to one. Um, so this function, uh, one of the parameters that you can set is the number of legs. So for example, if you want to do something like this, set it, the default is 12, but if you want to set it to 24, so or whatever number that you want, you can set it. The only thing that it might crash if you really overload over it, but uh, I think 24 should be fine. It's just limitation of probably memory or something like this. And then again, like if you see, maybe the it's too dense, but if you see here again, this is leg 12, it's really highly correlated. And, you, and when you go over here, leg 24, it's also really almost the same. It starts to open, but it's still really correlated. And then you see like in the middle, like where, which period are less correlated or more correlated. <coughs> um, so another application for forecasting uh, <coughs> is uh, functions to split time into training and testing, which I know maybe it exists, but I am not aware of. Uh, and usually you go and you start to do like the window function and define the, so I realize that I need to finish with this and create this function. Uh, residual analysis, which usually you should do when you do time series analysis, when you do like forecasting for 100 units, you don't really go and check each one of those and you try to automate it. But if you're doing one, a single model, so you should do it. Um, and then 
uh, performance evaluation for uh, testing and training models. So let's have like a small example. So taking the US gas data and we said we want to focus the next 12 months. So I use this function, the TS split. I'm taking the US gas and I'm set the sample out the, or the testing set into the horizon that I want to. So here it's uh, 12 months. And then I distribute it to two uh, objects, the trend and the test. And here you can see that this is the trend and this is the test, the last, so it's the last 12 months. And then let's try three different models. So I'm starting with, usually when you do forecasting, you take a baseline model, you take the, uh, s technically you should use the simple model. In this case, it's season naive. I technically, it's a model that doesn't really work unless you have uh, really nice seasonal data. Uh, so it's kind of lying to yourself you, if you are taking a naive model, you usually want to use more robust, but this is like for this example, it's all fine. And we're taking uh, this model from the forecast package. Uh, we're setting the trend as a, the tr as a training set. And then we want to forecast the set the horizon to 12 months. So we set the edge to 12. Uh, and <coughs> we put it in this object and now we want to evaluate it so you can do the accuracy function from the forecast package which gives you all the, the information but if you want to see to see to visualize it and see how good your fit uh how your your data is fit onto testing uh this is another way so this is give you a representat representation of the the blue one is the actual the red one is the fitted, is what the model saw when he trained the model. And the green one is the what you use to focus, which the model didn't see. And overall, it's, overall it's look really nice. Um, so the, you can see over here, or you can get like some dilat of the root mean square error and the, and the mean absolute percentage error. So those are two of the main uh, matrices that you use to evaluate the performance of your model. So basically, uh, the means, mean absolute percentage error is saying how, how far have you been on each month on average, taking the absolute value. You don't want to, uh, that the minus and the plus will take each other. Um, and this model achieved, so on the training, it achieved 5.17% error and in the testing 6.2 which is kind of makes sense your your testing will always be a bit higher than your training it's look nice um and seasonal mo seasonal naive model work well because we have your good seasonality basically it's taking what was the last in in the case of seasonal uh, model it's take what was last year and put it this year um uh, that's why when your data is look a bit messy, this is nice data. When your data look a bit messy, it won't work. And then the second one, I'm using the auto arima, which is uh, um, it's a nice function from the forecast package that automates the tuning parameters of the arima. Uh, so the arima has basically three parameters. It's the arima model is stand for auto regression moving average and it's take the relationship between the current legs, the current uh, observation and the previous legs and set some kind of relationship using coefficient. Uh, so this model just automate the process of finding and tuning the, those parameters. And I think this is one of the only one that available that in time series that is tuning automatically the parameters, which is not unlike machine learning that you can really do a good tuning aut automation in time series it's still kind of not in that phase unfortunately and this model so this model did well it did uh, 3.5 in the training set and 4.4 in the testing 
compared to six and five in the previous one. Um, and then the last one is a neural network uh, for time series. This is one of the awkward <coughs> models in the in the forecast package. It's really it's like a wild horse. Nobody knows how to train it. Uh, but you can really get sense about the direction. You need to try. I mean, there's no, you, do, you can feel like what is the direction. There are some kind of guidance, but the idea is it's using a deep, deep, uh, it's not deep learning. It's uh, actually, it's neural network with one layer. So it's not deep. Uh, and then setting regress it with the previous legs. So in this case, um, we, we use a layer of 200 and we got with this model and, and, and as, as you see like forecasting really easy like the this is what you use the syntax it's fairly simple to forecast because there are no much training parameters uh, and in this case we got that the training the map is sorry I can't see from there uh, I think it's like it's close to 0 0.9 and the training is, the testing is 4.7. It means that we are really overfitting because there is a gap between what we got in the training and the testing. Uh, so here we can use the insight we saw before. So one of the things that we saw before that there is high correlation between the previous uh, periods and we can use it to set the two parameters, additional two parameters in this model. So in this case, the two parameters is the uppercase P, which is saying like I want to regress with the previous uh, period, seasonal period. So for example, I will take for channel, I will take the previous channel if P equal one, and if it P equal two, I will take last January and the January the year before, like two years ago. And this is saying like what is the relationship between the previous. Uh, Period. So if I'm in January, I regress it with December if it's set to one, and if it's set to two, I will regress it with December and November. So as we saw before, that this is there is a lot of relationship between previous years, and I set it also for 12 months, taking the last 12 observation, and it's kind of really improved. It still fits really close in the training, which is kind of what neural networks are doing. To really find the how to tune it really to fit to the training, uh, but it's really improved with this 3.2 in the in the testing. So I mean, this is like give you like three different approach, and then you can go and decide like what to use. Because one of the main thing about forecasting is that you can use it now, but you don't know how well it will do in the future until the data will come. So. I think this is one of the main thing of the main reason I did this function um, is to kind of give you like how does it look and any questions so far? Okay. So here is just where this roadmap, where this package is going. Um, <coughs> so I, this is was the second release and I think the next release I'm going to focus mainly on the predictive side uh, the first and the second release were uh, focusing on the descriptive side the, the visualization and I think uh, one of challenges that I'm facing doing forecasting is that the automation uh, if you have multiple so usually you don't just focus one series you have multiple series and how to train and evaluate those series to optimize your results. Uh, and until now I do, I'm just doing like big function that's taking a lot of models, evaluate them and evaluate them over time, not by one inst instance. So in this case, we're just using one time, but if I really want to check if this model is really accurate, I need to start over here to focus 12 months and then shift it and see then how the model is doing over time. Um, and so the idea what I'm trying to build, if someone familiar with the H2O package. So the H2O package, they release a new algorithm. I mean, it's not something unique only for them, but they have a good algorithm for 
it's called the auto ML. You just throw your data and it's train it and you get uh, it's like a death match between models. So you have like the running and according to your setting, the running deep learning, XGBoost, GLMNet and all the models that they have and then you get the one that really uh, so the idea is to do something similar, to take Arima, to take a, a external smoothing, old winter and all those models and try to see which one perform over time uh, the best and give you like the output that the information that you want and if you want to automate it, it, it will make the decision automatically based on criterion that you will define or think it's, it's the, the, the right one. Another thing that uh, I want to add is, so this is, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this package, the BSTS, it's a uh, Bayesian Structural Time Series uh, model. It's a really good model actually. Uh, it's almost, when I'm testing multiple models, it's almost come, came as the first one. Uh, while most of us really love the forecast package, people that are doing forecasting, there are some other things over there uh, that really recommend to explore. Um, so this one of those, and it's work differently, it's kind of awkward, it doesn't work. So the forecast packet work on TS, TS objects. Uh, you cannot run model with the uh, XTS or zoo objects with the forecast. And the Bayesian structural time series work with data frame. So the idea is to you need you throw your data and it will convert it to all the formats that each model require and it give you the results. You won't need to do all the conversion and this is another challenge working with time series. You want to test multiple models. There is the other model that Facebook released, the Profit, if anyone heard about it. So they release a forecasting model that they build based on also based on statistical methods uh, which is just you need to set it into a different structure which is different from all the rest uh, so the idea is take all of those into one place and automate it so one of the challenges that I had with the seasonality plots is that if you go to daily, how you plot daily data? So what is your, it's like the question, what is the cycle? So is it every 30 days? Is it seven days? Is it, so you, when you think about it, this is clear when you have 12 months, this is your cycle. But when you going to a lower, uh, below months, you could have multiple cycles. And it's really challenging to represent it in a, in a way that people will look and understand because I think here you can really understand the picture. If you will plot 365 box plot, I don't think it's really anywhere. Uh, then the question is it should be like seven days, uh, seasonality or across months. Mm -hmm. it's, so it's something I'm, I'm trying to figure out. I really not, don't have an answer yet. Uh, so day is the one frequency, but if you go to seconds or minutes and it's become more complicated so it's kind of <coughs> and I think that like this is like not in the coming release but like somewhere in the future to convert it into a uh, shiny app that you will just throw your data uh, and run a command and it will you will get a kind of dashboard you will use sliders to create models so all the tuning parameters all the information will be there and then you can tune models with slider which is how i see it in the future and that's why from the first place i'm feeding it to fit into shiny uh, if you, uh, i didn't ask anyone familiar with shiny okay shiny is cool uh, yeah i think basically that's it. Uh, any questions? Have you ever seen, uh, you talked about, you know, seasonality. Yeah. Uh, and you, you show nice, and you talk about whether it be how you define it. Like for, I was in a business where we had seasonality, but it was for July and August, and then we went on vacation, and then it was the last two weeks of December. 
how would I, how would you be able to go about dealing with that? So I would see if the model is capturing it, mm -hmm. and if not, I would flag it. So for example, I would take like a Remax mm -hmm. model and create flags variables uh, for those months. Okay. So for example, if you know that end of December is different char char characteristic than the summer, I would set it, for example, to one and the other one two. Right. And it's all experiment. You need to play with it and see if it's improved. Sometimes it's improved, sometimes it's not. Because uh, then like if you set it like I'm yearly seasonality, you it won't work on the other periods. Because if you don't have seasonality and it's random. I think the general approach is dummy variable. And uh, so for example, Valentine's Day flower sales is one sale very much. Right. Or Thanksgiving sales or Black Friday sales. So you basically put uh, minus five days and plus five days around that period and essentially try to simulate it. So in this case, it's the vacation time, July, August, and then the last two weeks of uh, December. And then you basically uh, would do that uh, using uh, you know, the uh, arbitrary one, two, three variable. Yeah. In literature, it's called dummy variable approach to do regression. Yeah, and 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 going back to this, uh, the Facebook algorithm, they had the option to add holidays. Mm -hmm. So uh, not holidays, but like in the, so they model was built to focus sales like internet sales, and then there are some events like Super Bowl, Valentine's Day that really skew your data, and you want to take into into account those events. So this is like they put options to enter. A vector with dates that you know that are going to be like holidays or stuff like this. Um, so this is another way to look at it. So the machine learning is uh, I'm sure it says that uh, ended with the CD of update. So do you have any comments you want to avoid of updating program in the time frame space? Is there any way to combat time frame space that you know not easily propagate in hyper Yeah. So, the good question. So the question was uh, about overfitting of time series data uh, and how to avoid it. So, for example, uh, at, at least that's what I, I'm doing is I'm evaluate model over time. So, like when you split in in normal machine learning, you split into seventy, thirty, or you're doing cross validation, <coughs> and you get your output and use it. In time series, it's a bit different because there are relationships between the periods. Uh, so your split is related to the time. So I, I use kind of window function and start to split somewhere here and focus, for example, if I'm evaluating 12 months, focus the next 12 months, shift it one period and do it a few times. And I'm measuring how much the, the forecasted values perform. So for example, if a model like this, I think it was, yeah, this one, that it's, it did really a bad job because the error here was almost 5% and in the training it was close to less than 1%. So if you see something like this, you should have like a red light or something like this. Um, and one approach would take the ratio between the training and the testing. So the ratio between the map of your testing and the training and see like, but it could be also dangerous because then like you need to set some boundaries that you might get like 20% in the training and 20% in the testing as compared to one and 4.7. So maybe the 4.7 at least still better. So. I guess it's just don't trust one time testing, do it over times, simulate it, make sure that your model is not overfitting. Just out of curiosity, what what type of data have you worked with that you have found the most challenging in 
building a decent forecasting model? <laughs> oh, it was last week. <laughs> uh, I got the data of uh, daily sales. Uh, it's not sales transaction, like order from customers. That was, there was no any correlation, no, it was all random. And there are holidays in between. Uh, so we, and one another, another thing was that it's daily and we didn't have a full year. So it's all over, it was really bad. We had to try like so many approaches until we saw something uh, and it is, uh, and again, it's the thing like uh, sometimes you need to be aware that you won't be able to get like the best accuracy on all types of that. This is really academic example, yeah. uh, but in real life, most of the time it doesn't look like this. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, um, like. Yeah, this is the unemployment. Uh, I mean, here though, you see like the, the cycles, unemployment met, and the cycles are, you have cycles in the data, you have seasonality, and the cycles are not, the, the periods are not constant. So, I mean, it, you can, this is something that is like real life problem, that you can probably forecast it, but if the, you probably won't be, accurate on when the cycle is changing and you might miss it. So it is another question where to start your training, how to split your data. And I guess this is this you need to test <coughs> it's like like doing like playing with your data and research it. Do you have anybody else contributing the package? No. Not at the moment. So how do you decide, because something like unemployment is, is a function of many other factors, economic output, and I, I don't know what else. How do you decide whether to model a time series as a time series, or whether to, to build it in, put, put it in some kind of multi multivariate model? So, yeah, so the question was how, how you decide if to use many um, multivariate model or single model. And the question is always if the data is available, if you know what is the driver, use it. And there are many time series models that you can use regression, um, like the ARIMA, you can use it with as regression, it's the ARIMA X, and the neural network model you can also use. Other approaches, you can use it with machine learning model. So one of the uh, thing that I used to do uh, to improve forecasting is to do ensemble learning for time series models, which is kind of taking multiple, like 20 models, different variation, uh, or different tuning, and then take the outputs, select, select the best one, and regress, take, take it into regression, and then convert it into regression from time series to regression problem. Uh, but if you have, for example, if you take the car sales in the United States, so this is the unemployment rate in the United States, and if you take and plot together the car sales, you will see that the car sales start to drop down, the unemployment goes up. And I think uh, now it's like end of the cycle of the car sales. So maybe we should think about, I don't, know, don't want to jinx it, but. <laughs> Uh, I think we are in the end of the cycle. Oh, yeah. Is your end goal to have people run the Shiny app on their local computers, or do you plan to like host this, people would go to the website, and now you have to have a running R installation on their computer? Yeah, the idea is for now is people run it on their website. Uh, sorry, on their machine. Uh, I, I mean, if, and to put option if somebody want to open a cluster on Amazon Web Service or something like this, that you have the option to do it by itself, uh, but like the really open open source platform. Actually, we can, can I 
open the Arc Studio? Yeah. Um, oh, it's the yeah, Shift tab. Control tab. Yeah. <laughs> Why the? So we try. I try to install it before. Let's see if it's installed. It. So that's it. Yeah, you you, you don't have. So this warning is just saying that you don't have anything loaded in your R. But where is my? <coughs> oh, found you. But the idea is that you can run it and it will open on your browser. And from this stage, you don't need to code anything. And you can, for example, if you have any installed installed data set or anything in your memory, you can load it all out of. And here is the first one that pop up is the air passenger. So let's load it and then go play with it. Technically, this is the, the other package. So the idea was to all the functions from time series here to outsource it with the other package and reduce the code over here. And this is what I'm thinking about building for time series because I in <coughs> initially I thought to uh, build one plat platform that you will do everything like machine learning and if you have time series do time series but it's I think it's too complicated and if someone wants to do time series he usually don't really want to do cluster analysis or segmentation or something like this so you use these packages in your work? Actually, yesterday was the first time I used my, the, the other package. Uh, was like, was super cool. Um, and I hope that other people will use it because uh, most of the functions are like, came out of daily work. Yeah. Splitting your data instead of writing like the window and start to stuff like this. This package is, is more conceptual. Uh, and uh, we talked about before that it's really time consuming to start to build those packages. So it's, it's kind of been old since December. I start to work on the other package and then there are other projects. So it's kind of going slow, but yeah, this is like my main package that I'm working on. And here's like the, the same one that you saw before. Yeah. Well, for example, um, I had to forecast five years, which is really challenging because first, it really won't be your your error is really function of time, mm -hmm. um, and not always you have five years of data to train, and this has become more challenging. So like. For example, for m when you're using monthly data and you want to forecast five years or to infinity, you need at least 24 months. And after that, you can really forecast to infinity, but it won't really something reliable. And this is something when I think that you're working with other people and they expect some magic forecast, they need to be aware that five years from now, probably there are other factors like uh, I know oil 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 prices change because of war somewhere or Putin decided decide to go to other places in the Middle East or I know some other reasons and it really changed other stuff that you don't can consider now. So the sh the, the, it's a long answer, but the short answer is uh, you can do it, but you need to be aware about the accuracy. So, for example, in a military perspective. Suppose you have a military data set for a daily data set, and you wanted to forecast it 
two days. It's, it's, it's like a daily pattern, daily seasonality yeah. that you have, but you just want to protest two days. Not even, you know, long term. It, it looks like it's just two days, but uh, it's like a 2,000 time stamp that you wanted to protest. What is the frequency? One minute. Oh. Yeah, uh, but if you have enough samples, mm -hmm. you can yeah, maybe. If you have one year. So yeah, because you don't need the whole year probably to. Well, if you have the whole year, you so this is one of the things that you have multiple uh, seasonality, mm -hmm. and not all the models know how to handle it, because you have your probably the hour. I know what is the data, but like for example, they think about co consumption of electricity. The demand for electricity is high during the day and low during the night. And then the, it's maybe higher during the weekend compared to weekday. Uh, and then the, the first seasonality is during the winter. So then it's become really messy. And uh, I think that there is one way to use a Fourier series to enter it into the, to regress it with Fourier series to capture the seasonality the multiple cycles um, but you can do it depend how good is your seasonality does it make sense So not yet. Someone actually asked about the stationary analysis and all this, and probably it's one of the things in the future. Uh, for now, I mainly focus on something that I feel that are maybe for me it's practical. Uh, for my that I feel that maybe other people will use, but it's definitely the aim is to add as much as possible statistical application that either or not exist or you can do it in a nicer way 